Welcome to the Home Bar Beginner. I'm Vic Vinegar, and today we're going to be going over some of the simple bar tools. So I'm going to be doing two videos on bar tools. This first one's going to be going over what we'd consider kind of the basics. Now, albeit really none of them are necessary, but like any good toolkit, you don't necessarily need anything in there, but it's going to get the job done a lot quicker. So today we're going to go over some that are pretty basic. They're applicable to most drinks that you'd be making, but also they're fairly easily replaceable. We'll go over some of those things that cheaper alternatives or ways you can avoid using them. In general, a relatively cheap set of most of these tools isn't going to run you a ton of money. Um, for example, this set here that I have um, includes more than we're even going to be talking about today. We'll talk about some of the more advanced tools of refinement, whatever you want to call them, in a separate um, segment. This set here costs right about 70 bucks off Amazon. I mean, that's pretty expensive for a beginner set. Um, really, you're paying about 35 bucks to get matching stainless steel, to get a name brand, and to get a stand like this. This is supposed to be a decorative stand. It is. I think it's very pretty, but you don't need to do that. You can honestly piece together a kit of just what you need for really around 20 bucks for most of the things you want to get. Um, I can absolutely put some recommended links down in the description of the video to give you a direction on where you can find some of those things, but Amazon's really your go-to. So the first tool we're going to be talking about today is arguably the most important for a bartender or for bartending at home. So that's going to be the jigger. So the jigger, much like in cooking and baking, you have a tablespoon, is both a unit of measurement and a tool itself. So the jigger really is to cocktails what the tablespoon is to baking and cooking. Now I'll also discuss how you can just use a tablespoon in bartending later on, but just suffice to say, jigger is very important for what we're going to be doing and if you want to be bartending. So there's four major types of jiggers. Each one is preference-based. Really it's up to you. Some are, you could argue, a little more professional, a little more home bar oriented, but at the end of the day, they all get the job done. So the very first one up is the double jigger. That is arguably your simplest, most common type of jigger. It comes in most of your home bar kits. It's also just the cheapest outright. So for example, something like this runs you like two bucks on Amazon. I've actually found them at like Goodwill and stuff for like 50 cents. So they're stainless steel. They last a really long time. Nothing wrong with it. Um, this is also a standard double jigger. This came in this set. Um, this is a pretty small one. I'll kind of explain why in a moment, but this is probably the most common you're going to see. So the way the cups work, they're each an exact measurement if you fill them to the brim. So this top cup here is an ounce and a half. This is one ounce. So those are some of your common measurements that you're going to be using. So if you fill them right up to the brim, you know what you've got. I'm saying this one's a little smaller. This is a half ounce on one side in a full ounce on the other. This is the more common. Some of the advantages are how, or one of the advantages is how wide the base of it is. So if you look, it is just generally pretty wide, especially the ounce and a half end. So some things that that affords you is as you're pouring in liquid, I'm just using water for now not to be wasteful, as you're pouring it in, very stable so it's that wide base keeps it from tipping you can accidentally bump it quite a bit you're probably not going to tip it over so honestly if you've already made a couple of drinks or something and you think you're going to be getting a little clumsy around the kitchen or if you've got people running around this might be your best bet and like i said this is even the smaller cup or the smaller side and it still doesn't want to tip but as you may have literally just saw the disadvantage is once you go to pick it up all that surface area means it splashes a lot so that can be problematic so it depends kind of where you think you're going to be more coordinated sitting on the table or as you're going to transfer your drinks this one would be a little more guilty of tipping over just because it is narrower but as i mentioned itself it is smaller so you're not going to have as much mass up at the top to be able to tip it over even that takes quite a bit so as your double jiggers, like I said, super cheap, really common, um, but they don't do a great job of transferring in between, and they also only have two measurements each. So 
you really you could guesstimate how much um, say like an ounce is based on or three quarters of an ounce based on this side but cones can be really hard to just guess that stuff so the next one that I don't actually have on hand but I'll display it up here is the bell style jigger so the bell style is really um, almost identical to the double jigger in every way except for the aesthetics and the ergonomics. So they have a rounded design in between, more hourglass shape. You can get your fingers in there, like it's just a little more ergonomic, you can get a better grip. So they're not as wobbly as you go to transfer your liquids to your drink. That can be an advantage. Um, they do cost a little more, they're a little more rare. I won't belabor them too much. Really, it is a adaptive version of the double jigger. The third one that is pretty widely professionally used is the Japanese style jigger. So um, this is my preferred jigger of choice, largely just based on aesthetics. I really like it. It's heavy. It looks pretty stainless steel. It's really tall. Um, the other big advantage to the Japanese style jigger is that it has lines on the inside. I'll get a close up so you can see them. It has lines on the inside so you can measure pretty much any common measurements. So your common measurements are going to be a half ounce, three quarter ounce, one ounce, 1.5 ounce, which is a standard shot in the US, or two ounces. So like I said, the double jiggers can only do two. The Japanese jigger can do five. So it has lines on the inside to mark out the one or the half ounce, the three quarter, and then the full top is an ounce. There's a line on the inside of the top one to show you where you hit an ounce and a half, and then the full cap is two ounces. So one of the downsides, which was the upside of the double jigger, hard to tip over, the Japanese jigger doesn't take much. So if you are getting a little clumsy or if you just are clumsy and you're pretty confident you're gonna knock that over or have one of your guests knock that over, it might not be for you. Um, I've had it knock over and it will sling stuff all the way across your kitchen. So, Take that for what it's worth. But on the flip side, what it does afford you is it has a pretty narrow end. What that does is it creates a small surface area. So you run the risk of knocking, knocking it over a little more often, but since there's less surface area, it's harder to actually spill it as you go to transfer it. So I can move this around pretty easily, like pretty carelessly, and I'm not gonna get much spillage. I just got a little bit there finally. So when it comes to transferring your drinks or building your drinks, this is the better for that. So if you're a little shaky doing this, you're probably fine. So that's a big advantage there in terms of movement. And then it has the advantage of having the individual marks on the inside. So the last type and is another one that I don't have sitting here, but will be displayed right here is the graduated jigger. That is not to say it is any more advanced, it's to say it's reminiscent of the graduated cylinder. So the graduated jigger has markings all the way up the top and it has every increment, I believe in half ounces typically. So you go up from half ounce or down to a quarter ounce actually, because you go to a half ounce, three quarter ounce, ounce, all the way up. So that's what a lot of professionals use as well. Part of the reason behind that, you can work with it very quick. Some of them are very large, so you can build almost a full drink in the jigger itself. The downside with them is that you have to be pretty good at pouring, hence why professionals tend to use them. The reason being, it's really easy to over pour one of those quarter ounce lines. They can be kind of hard to see, so you really need to have a pretty good vibe of how much you've been pouring, or on average, how long it takes to pour a given amount. So the pros like to use it, they are very helpful. They can get you a lot of precise measurements. So if you are really big on nailing your measurements every single time to keep consistency, or you're just scientific like that, it's probably your go-to option. So in terms of purchasing any of these, like I said, none of them are terribly expensive, especially with these double jiggers. They're on like $2 a piece. You can obviously get them more expensive if you want. I got a set of these Japanese jiggers for something like, I think it was 11 bucks for a set of three, which for me is worth it. You don't want to spend more than a couple bucks on it absolutely don't have to you will still get the job done and if you want to spend even less than that I've got a couple of substitutes for you so like i said tablespoons in baking and cooking 
they work here too. Some recipes, even some drink recipes, even call for like a half tablespoon or a tablespoon of, for example, like lemon juice is a pretty common one that will sometimes go by tablespoon measurements. So it's pretty good odds you have a set of these in your kitchen or can pick them up super cheap. So these work perfectly fine. You can look up direct conversions between um, fluid ounces that you would find for your jiggers and what equals tablespoons and teaspoons. The other thing you can do that's arguably even simpler, just use a shot glass. So a shot glass is 1.5 fluid ounces. Almost exact, there's a specific amount for a US shot glass. Um, I want to say it's just under 1.5. You'll still get the job done. So something like this, you can kind of tell it's fluted. Um, this would be a little harder to estimate, but some that are just your traditional conical shot glasses, you'd have no trouble estimating like what half a shot is and this and that. So that's what I did getting started. I didn't have any of the fancy jiggers, so just use a shot glass. You're not going to nail your measurements every time. It's going to be guesswork, but you will make the drink you intend to. If you're making stuff that is that complicated, that you need those precise measurements with the shot glass, you might have issues, but up to that point, you'll probably be fine. So the next tool that is pretty indispensable for a bartender or for somebody making drinks at home is the shaker. So it's a pretty quintessential tool. You've probably seen one of these, at least in the movies. I think the one of the most famous movie lines possible, Shaken Not Stirred from James Bond, where he wants his martinis shaken. So this is arguably the most common type of shaker, especially for home bars. So this is a copper shaker. It's a pretty big copper shaker. I'll kind of get into why in a moment, but it also goes by a three piece shaker. As in it goes by the name three piece shaker. For the reason being, it breaks into three pieces. So some of the really nice things about these cobbler or three piece shakers is that they're really easy to use. So. You put all of your ingredients down into the drink with your ice, put the cap on, or the lid, and then put the cap on. Hold it all together, kind of press from both ends, and you shake it. So they're super easy to use and show you, and you can usually just leave the cap and the lid connected. They don't fall apart all that easy. Put ice in first, typically. Add all your ingredients in, put the cap on. So one of the things that the ice does aside from dilutes and cools your drink is it actually shrinks the metal slightly. So this is stainless steel, so it has quite a bit of effect on it. And what that does is it shrinks the cap or it shrinks the lid down onto the rest of the shaker. So what that does is it gives you a tighter seal. So like right now, even now it's not leaking. If you get some of the cheaper ones, they might leak before they start to cool down. Kind of doubt it. Like this isn't even a terribly expensive one and it's not leaking whatsoever. But you can see I'm holding onto the base and the lid with one hand or start with two hands. That's arguably probably your safest. I also like to put my thumbs on the top and then grip with the rest of it, with the rest of the shaker. And you can start to get fancy and do whatever you'd like. But one of the nice things about this type of shaker is you can pop this cap off and there is a built-in strainer. So these are really nice because you don't need to buy another strainer. I'll get into strainers in a second, but you can see you can just pour right up the top. And what that does, that filters the ice out, it filters some of your bigger particles out. Say you have berries in there or something that would, or mint leaves is a really common one. The strainer in these aren't great. I'll get into why as I explain the other strainers a little down the road in this video. Suffice to say, it's not the best in terms of straining, but if it's what you've got, it's what you've got. And you really don't need to buy a strainer for a while. This will really take care of most of your drinks. One of the big downsides is like I said, with this specific cobbler style of three piece, it's like I said, that lid shrinks onto the top. So what that does is like right now, I'm having no trouble popping this off. You can kind of hear that seal break. When it shrinks, it can be pretty hard to pop off. I played around with some 
like fairly cheap, like five, seven dollar Amazon ones. And don't get me wrong, they work, they do their job. But when that constricts on, you can bet it's gonna be hard to pry off. I've had to like run it under warm water before to re-expand the metal. If you're gonna spend a little more on anything, I do it on this to make sure you get a good seal so it doesn't leak and so you can actually pop it off when you're done with it. So that's your basic cobbler shaker. This is what I use, this is what a lot of home bars use. Like I said, this is a relatively big one, meaning I can do two drinks in here pretty easy. Three if it's the right type. Um, a lot of cobbler shakers that you find in like your department stores or something like a Walmart, a lot of them are pretty small. Um, so they're for single drinks. That's totally okay if that's what you're doing. It's also great for travel purposes. It fits and stows a lot easier. On the downside, it can be annoying to only be able to make one drink at a time, even to make the same drink in succession. You need to open it up. Whenever you open it up, it seems like stuff a little bit runs down the side or whatever, you end up wanting to rinse it. The bigger one is better for that sort of stuff, especially if you're cranking out multiple drinks, especially the same type of drink. So the next type of shaker is not sitting in front of me as well as neither is the third. So I'll pop up an image right here is the most commonly used by professional bartenders, and that is the Boston Shaker. So the Boston Shaker is really simple in design and just conceptually. So it's two halves of a shaker. It's typically either, a, or a tin on tin is what most people use now, where it's one big tin, one little tin, and you just jam them into one another really hard. That gives you your seal, shake it, and then you just pop the top one off. And if you watch any of those videos or any videos where bartenders use the Boston shaker, you will see quite literally they just like smack that thing and knock it off the top to break the seal. The more traditional uses one tin and one glass, a really heavy bar glass. Um, it looks cooler because you can put all your mix or all your ingredients into the glass, slam the tin on top, shake it, you can see the color change, blah, blah, blah. This glass is break sometimes. So that can be a little messy. If you're running a bar, it's relatively affordable. If you're in your kitchen and you break one of those and it goes everywhere, and you're spending five bucks a glass, I don't know how much you wanna do that. So the 10 on 10 shaker is really what a lot of professionals move to. Super easy to clean, super easy to use. Their seal's usually not as good as the cobbler style shakers, so you can get a little bit more leakage. So in a home bar setting, they're not always great because you tend to fling stuff around your kitchen a little more. They're also just really big, so they're a bit to store. They don't look as neat with the exception of the with the glass where you can see the ingredients on the side. They're definitely not as ornamental as the cobbler shaker or the third style that I'm gonna talk about. They're pretty cheap, the Boston shakers, so if, if you wanna pursue that, absolutely. You will definitely look more professional. They won't necessarily look as elegant. So the final type of shaker, which as I mentioned, I don't have sitting here either, is the Parisian style shaker or the French style shaker. So the Parisian style works very similarly to the cobbler shaker, except that it is a two piece, just like the Boston shaker. So it's a little bit of the best of both worlds, also has the downsides of both. So I won't get too in depth. It's the least common of the shakers. It's arguably the most ornamental. There's some really beautiful ones out there. Not a ton of people use them just because they don't have the built-in strainer of the cobbler style, which is one of the selling points of having the lid style like that. And it still has the issue with the lid constricting onto the rest of the tin. So it has the downsides of the cobbler shaker without the distinct upsides. It does only have two pieces, so it's less to clean, less to keep track of, and they are more ornamental. They're typically smaller as well, so they're more, more so single drink shakers. But you can absolutely check it out. It's really a preference between the three. I'm not saying you go out and buy all three and try them back to back, but over time, over the years, or if you're at a friend's house and they have something different, just go ahead and explore these different things. Like I said, you're probably best off with the cobbler shaker. It's all but guaranteed what's gonna come in any sort of home bar kit. So you can check that out. Also, just like the jiggers, if you don't wanna spend anything right now, which I kind of advise you don't, if you don't have to spend money, don't. There are pretty easy substitutes for a shaker. So for one, 
There's plenty of drinks that call to be shaken that just don't need to be. They can be stirred with a spoon or whatever. Pretty much anything where you don't need the drink to be frothy, you could stir. And stirring is pretty easy. You just find something you can stir it in, get a knife, a spoon, whatever, and do it that way. A few drinks do call to be shaken no matter what. Those are your drinks like your sours, anything with an egg white in it. I'll get into that in a future video too if that sounds like a totally foreign idea. But if you're trying to get it really frothy, then you do need to shake it. Or if you're trying to get a ton of dilution, like if it's a really alcoholic mix that you put in there and you really want to water it down, it should be shaken. So let's get yourself a shaker in the form of a water bottle. So it's just a standard water bottle. You could absolutely use anything like a camel bag or um, I mean anything, any of those. <laughs> common trendy brands. You can also just find anything off the shelf or anything you have around your house. I don't recommend using like an actual plastic water bottle. They usually say not to refill those just for plastic leaching back into your drink. But if it's anything that you normally refill and put your drinks in or your water in, it should be safe. This one, for example, is one of the double walled. I mean, the absolute name brand for that would be Yeti, but you can find anything cheaper than Yeti. So, that will keep your drink itself much cooler. I mean, these are single wall stainless steel, so typically keeping the drink cold to that degree isn't of immediate concern. So arguably in that regard, these would do a better job than your traditional shakers. So they're a little harder to clean. They're definitely less ornamental. You're not gonna look as professional, but they get the job done. So if this is what you have around and you're just getting into this and don't wanna drop a pretty penny, do it that way. That is smart and nobody's gonna judge you for that. So keep that in mind, there are ways to avoid spending money. So some of the last things that I want to talk about in your basic bar kit, so things that aren't necessary but really help you get most of the job done are strainers. So I talked about in the cobbler shaker for example, you have the built-in strainer. So hold it up. Yeah, you can see the holes through there. They're pretty big holes, honestly. So they let a lot through, including like ice chips. Some people are really persnickety with ice chips in their drink, especially if it is something like a shake and martini where it's supposed to just be pure booze at that point and you really don't wanna have the ice chips in there. It could be pieces of mint if you are doing what's called muddling, another technique I'll talk about a little, or in another video. You could have bits of berries or something in the bottom. This strainer will let, let quite a bit of it out. If you're using the Parisian or Boston shaker, then it's gonna let everything out. So you need to be able to strain your drinks. So, the go-to for most circumstances is what's called a Hawthorne strainer. Now these come in a multitude of different styles, but they all function at their base almost identical. And the difference in these styles really comes down to the holes you see in the back here. So this one almost looks like it has some sort of like can opener in the middle. I don't know how else to describe it. And then a couple concentric rings. There's ones with tiny little holes. It, it really depends on how you're pouring your drinks. Like this one will divide the stream as it flows out so you can hypothetically pour drinks, two drinks at one time. In practice, that gets pretty messy, but there's not a whole lot of difference. They all function the same way. So you have this spring that goes along the edge and that doesn't necessarily do much to filter so much as it does to hold the strainer itself inside your tin. So especially if you buy them in a set, that is a big helpful thing of buying a set is that the strainer and the tin will match one another. They're pretty universal no matter what, like these are pretty standardized sizes. But what I mean by this is if you take your tin, take your strainer, that spring compresses just a little bit and keeps it hugged to the inside. Ooh. So it'll just hold it in even upside down. When you go to pour a drink, you're actually going to want to put your finger on top to hold that in because sometimes the weight of the liquid or the ice will pull it out. You don't want that to flop out and then you've got a real mess. So let's say you are making a drink as I mentioned, you'd also have your ice. Go ahead and do that. Give it a couple of shakes. So now you could either pour it out the top like we've shown before, 
Let's say you've got berry chunks in there or something, or you just want to look more professional. You take your Hawthorne strainer, you plug that on top, and now you pour it like that. So that will filter out a lot more. If you really tip this thing back, you can pour pretty fast. Basically the faster you go, the more chunks you get. So that's the kind of broad rule of thumb there. The other thing that you can do, instead of the Hawthorne strainer, like I said, that is pretty much the go-to, is use what's called a julep strainer. So a julep strainer is often, most often used with a mixing glass, and mixing glasses are something that I wanted to put in the advanced slash tools of refinement segment, or rather video, because the mixing glass itself isn't all that necessary, but the strainer can be. So the julep strainer is really just a series of fine holes on what is otherwise a glorified gigantic spoon. So what that does is it fits over your strainer or your mix, or sorry, fits over your tin or your mixing glass. This one actually fits really well and these aren't even from the same set. So it kind of goes to show the standardization. And then with that, you can pour like that. What these are more so is to hold ice back. So like I said, this is a lot of times with stirred drinks. Something like an old fashioned is another one where even though there's ice in the drink itself, it's the big one big ice cube, you usually have purists who don't want ice chips in there. So that's another good one for holding ice chips back. I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see this, but comparing the size of the holes between the two strainers, you can tell that the tulip strainer is finer the Hawthorne strainer is finest. And in the refinement video, I'm gonna talk about the finest type of strainer, but these are the two that are really go-to to get the job done really honestly, probably 90% of the time, if not 95% of the time, depending on what types of drinks you're making. These can be good. A lot of times they don't come in a set together, but they're not all that expensive individually either. You can check that out on Amazon. Like I said, I'll leave some links down there to show you some of the places that I personally bought my tools. So the last thing that we're going to discuss in this video of our bar basics is the bar spoon or our bar spoons. So this is the bar spoon that came in my kit or the kit that I bought I should say. If I hold it up close you can see it's just a little spoon on the end and then it's got these twists that run down the length of the shaft. So it's a pretty it's a pretty long spoon. So what that helps with is, you can use this picture for example, is mixing tall things, so especially if you're making something like a juice, like a, like a jungle juice punch or um, a tall stirred drink, like you have a really tall glass. Just get in there, see how this can reach all the way to the bottom. And to be honest, this one's pretty short for um, what they'd actually use at a bar. Not necessarily because you need it to be, but because it's even more ornamental. You'll see if you pull up like bar spoon tricks or whatever, you see people like twisting these all over the place and spinning around. They look like, like drum majors or something in a marching band. This one has a little flat on the end, so you can stand it up. It's helpful for video's sake, but a lot of them are just weighted on the other end to keep them balanced. So this is another one where it's a tool and a measuring device as well. The, some drinks will call for a bar spoon's worth of X. Sometimes it's bitter, sometimes it's sugar, sometimes it's something specific. So it is a little concavity, we'll make that a word, to the spoon itself. So you can pour a little bit in there. So that should be standardized among most bar spoons. If not, it's off by such a slight amount that you can, you'll be able to get the job done. No worries. The reason it's twisted around the shaft is something of moderate debate. Um, undoubtedly, it makes it more ornamental. So for beauty's sake, it definitely achieves that. Um, there are also arguments that as you go to pour a mixer in, something like say grenadine where it's a really bright red color, if you pour it down the shaft, supposedly the spirals help it get to the bottom of the liquid of the drink better. So if you're trying to do layering, another thing I'll talk about in a different or a later video, but if you're trying to do something like a tequila sunrise where the red's supposed to be on the bottom and the rest is supposed to be orange, supposedly if you pour down the shaft, it helps it get to the bottom better. 
like enters the like something about breaking the surface tension of the water get I don't know I don't know how much of it's made up science for the sake of explaining something looking pretty there's also arguments that it the spiral shape the helical shape mixes drinks better so as you go to mix it around that it breaks up the flow better and that it creates more turbulence in the water there's also I've heard the opposite argument that it leads to laminar flow in the liquid itself meaning that things aren't being turbulent they're not mix mixing together as much so um suffice to say that as you twirl this around it does mix your liquids that is what it's for um I think the science behind it needs um probably an engineering approach to really figure it out. That's not something I necessarily want to put the hours into modeling, so I'll leave that to somebody else if they see this and get really curious. The bar spoons are probably the most replaceable thing that's been on this video. You can use anything. Um, actually, one of the things that professionals recommend you learn to use first for proper stirring, which again, I'll, I'll bring up mixing glasses later, that's when you start to get fancy with it. For proper stirring is, they recommend you use a chopstick to start with. Um, so if you have a chopstick or some sort of kebab stick, that'll work perfectly fine for a really long time. Um, as far as the measurement, you can look up the exact conversion to something like teaspoons, see if you've got those measuring cups again. You can also just use a butter knife, a long spoon, really anything. Um, and there's not a whole lot of drinks that need to be stirred that couldn't also be shaken. Purists would get pretty mad about that, like if you shook somebody's old-fashioned, they'd probably get a little bent out of shape, but if they don't see it, if they can tell the difference, then they're a purist and they'll probably be mad at you. But if you're just getting started, you probably don't need all of this at that, even though I said these are kind of your basics, these are your fundamentals, this is your baseline toolbox. Not going to necessarily need all of them and you can certainly make do with other things. So like I said, replacing your jiggers with shot glasses and bars or and tablespoons. You can replace your shaker with a water bottle. You can replace your strainers. Uh, replacing your strainers can be a little tricky, but if you have one of these strainers built in, you can also use um, something like a whisk. If you hold that in your shaker, you can hold back the ice, so a whisk works fairly well. If you're really trying to filter a lot out, I guess you can pour it through a coffee filter, that would take a long time. But there's really alternative stitches about all of this. And a bar spoon, just get anything long and that you can comfortably put into your liquid without thinking it might poison you. So these are most of your basic things. Like I said, they're pretty replaceable. Um, most of them should come in a kit together, with the exception of maybe the julep stringer. But yeah, with these, you can make pretty much any drink that's out there. Um, there are some that require some really specialty tools. There are some that should, you should employ some specialty tools. But at the end of the day, with enough effort, you can pretty much do anything. Once again, it's like having a nice toolbox. You don't necessarily need all the tools in there to get the job done, but they make it a lot easier. Please feel free to comment if you have any questions. Please go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to pick up any of my future tips. I am going to keep doing longer videos like this to be a little more comprehensive. So if you would like, just go ahead and comment and I can start to highlight where I talk about certain things in the video. So if you're just interested in, say, the shakers, then you can jump directly to the shaker section. So just let me know about that, how you're feeling there. And with that, I'm Vic Vinegar, and please check in on the next Home Bar Beginner video that should be dropping soon.